Alrighty, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Don't know if you're watching this or what time. All I know is that tonight on December 9th, if around four o'clock is the Circuits 1 final review for fall 2022. I am your host, Francis Castillo, as in the H this semester's HKM tutor. How y'all doing today? Hopefully everyone's doing well, studying for your finals. Um, so let's get right into it. Um, just to real quick iterate for your guys' final. Let's go ahead and uh, write a few things down real quick. So for your guys' final specifically, I would I recommend to study and understand pretty well is your resistive main and complex eminence. And this could mean for both main and main. If you know how to do both name and name, you're pretty much set there. But can you toss in your imaginary components? Can you work with J? Do you understand how to do your operations with it? Do you know that whenever you bring J across the across your fraction, it becomes negative J? Do you know the little things like that to make sure your algebra is on par and up to date so that we don't make any mistakes that way? Um, these are the main few things you probably should focus on, and I'm pulling this information from the rankings that Dr. Russell has released from this semester. Something else I would also recommend to know is you got to know your KVL, KCL, you know, just to actually understand what each problem is, your Ohm's law, and your Watt's law, which is just power. These are the few things I would recommend for you guys to look into and go ahead and make sure. An another quick tip I want to give before we begin is leaves and materials. Materials help whether we, you guys have looked at them or not, or just choose to ignore them. I don't care. Just please do yourself a favor. Look, take 30 minutes, an hour maybe. Just look through his material, see what's helpful. Now, now that you've gone through the course, you've seen the material, you've been exposed to it, not only via midterms, your promise sets, through his lectures, you've seen it before. Go back through, see what now clicks, see what makes sense. Even though most of his, most of his materials are lengthy and wordy, just go through, skim it, read it, just see what happens. You may never know which materials you've missed out on looking back at it now. Hindsight 2020, but hey, so worth a shot to have for the upcoming final. Um, and those are my few quick pointers I would recommend to go ahead and look into specifically. Um, all right, let's hop into it. So the first problem I'll be covering today is specifically a RC circuit. So let's go through and read it. RC network in figure three has been at rest for a long period of time with the switch S1 closed at T equals zero, S1 is open and as indicated under schematic using the values shown, you're asked to do the following. Calculate I, so I say voltage V4 and I4 necessary to complete the fill out table three, as in this table down here, and apply the values to generate and write fully the complete time domain expression for V4 found from the solution of the network describing equation. And all this is basically saying is, hey, uh, this circuit right here, find capacitor behavior in respect to your voltage and your current. So you want to know both. Well, let's figure out how we're going to do that. So I'm going to go through. And the first case I want to solve for is going to be T is less than zero. So T is so, so zero negative. Let's figure out how the circuit is going to behave real quick. So I'm actually going to adjust how I'm doing this real quick. Here we go. And that would do nicely. OK, so what we got is T0. So switch is currently closed right now. So let's redraw the circuit real quick. I like redrawing the circuits a lot just because they're very helpful in figuring out the mess that is the circuit, like what exactly is going on. It's helpful to me. I would recommend trying it out, see what happens. If you're not comfortable with it, then 
by all means, don't worry about it as long as you get the material down is my biggest concern for everyone. Don't mind me just redrawing the circuit to how it should behave. Pardon any. I guess my handwriting just pardon that. Don't mind me. A little lopsided, but that's fine. So this is R2. Here is R3. R1, nothing down the middle. Here is ground. And then here is G1. OK, so normally the capacitor would be there, but we understand once when a capacitor has reached its steady state charge, it's fully charged, it acts like an open because no more current can flow through it. Meaning this is how our behavior of our capacitor is at V0 minus. So let's figure out what exactly is our expression for that. Well, we know just from looking at it, so I'm looking at it, we know that it should be my inspection. V4 of 0 minus should just be equal to, well, if you look at it in terms of current, we can view a few things. We know there's some current traveling from R3. From our we know there's some current technically going through I4 of 0, but wait, there's nothing there. But there is still a value we can use to figure out to for voltage at least. So we know a couple things already. From here, I4 of 0 is a zero negative is equal to 0, 0.0 amps because so there's nothing flowing through it. That's how capacitors behave. Voltage is a little bit different though, but you guys may have already spotted it. It's equal to your negative R3 I3. And this just comes back from your convention and how you dictate your current flow going into no going out whichever convention you want active or passive is your call but since we already are given a direction from i4 we can claim that i3 is going down this way like this whether you like that convention or not is up to you i'm just here explaining how i would have most likely done it we have that and then we need to figure out well what i3 is what is i3 we can actually come back and use one of our tools that we've done before, and some of you might have noticed it too. It is technically a current divider. We can use a current divider to go ahead and figure out our value of I3 because it may not be as obvious. It is technically all in parallel with each other, so we know our current values and what they're going to be. So we know. We can use resistor one as the top because this is current divider. We don't want to use that exact value. We want to solve. If it was voltage, we would be trying to use R3. We're trying to find R1, though, as its next alternative, the summation of all your resistors at the bottom. And there we go. That is our current divider for I3. So let's go and solve this. Should we? Yeah. 1K over 10K ohms of 12 milliamps, because that is our source, just screw over there. And this is, well, it's going to be 12 over 10, but that it's milli, so you got to be careful about that. So I3 should equal 1.2 milliamps. So now we have one thing. We know for the case T0 minus, we know our V4, a zero minus should be equal to negative r3 i3 which is going to be equal to negative 3.6 volts and the current of i4 is zero minus is going to be equal to 0, 0.0 amps that's for T0 minus though, when the switch is closed, OK? Now the circuit is going to change behavior once when we open up that switch. So let's look at T0 exactly at 0, OK? This is going to be a little bit time to draw, so let me explain my thought process as I draw it. All I'm doing is really showing visually the cases of what's going on here, OK? Of what's going on because that is just how I like to operate when it comes to circuits. Circuits is a very visual thing. We see a lot of diagrams and schematics. 
and such. So I want to go ahead and see what exactly is going on. For each one, here's this then. Here we go, resistor, and then there you go. That's all we have there. OK, so this is still gauge one, R1, two, R3. Here is, this is now V4, zero. This is EJ2. And there we go, positive and negative. The convention is still assigned to it. Here's still our current of I3 going down. Here's current of I2. You know, current of I4. You're traveling to the right. Here of I4. And there we go. So, so now let's look at a couple of things. Okay, let's compare the differences of our voltages first. So we know a couple of things. We know our voltage directly at zero. Since the switch isn't directly affecting any component related to it or any direct contact with it, there's no potential difference uh, that we see now. So that, that basically means that since our switch doesn't directly affect our voltage directly at V0, we can claim V0 minus and V0 is going to be equal to 3.6 volts. No damage. Well, I4 can be stated similar manner where we can actually see that I4 is just going to be equal to the difference of I3 minus I2. Well, we know what the current of 3 is. We just have to figure out the current of 2, or do we? Well, the behavior of the system of our circuit changed, so we have to go through and figure out again, well, how does it actually work? So let's go in and just make those equations now. So, so we're going to start off with I3, OK? We look at the current for I3 and see what exactly is going on with it. We can see a couple things, OK? So using resistor 3, obviously, when you figure out what the voltage is going across resistor 3. Well, resistor 3 is located right here. That's what we want. And we can see the voltage of three is most likely going to be a difference of sorts between two components. So we can see two sources because now that our capacitor is no longer getting charged, it's technically acting as a source, you could say, that's going to dissipate over time or not. That's what we're here to figure out. So looking at V4 and EG2, we can say it's a difference of it. As the current is traveling to the right from positive to negative across V4, we can say it's going to be EJ2 minus V4 zero to get our current value. There's going to be 9 volts minus negative 3.6 volts all over 3K. And we get a current value of. 0.2 milliamps, OK? That's that. Well, let's do the same as I process for I2 now. Well, I2 is at, the, is at the top. There's no real direct connections, but we can still assume one thing right now. We can say that this node right here, so here's a little trick you can do. According to nodal analysis, our nodes can contain a respective voltage that is equal to the network it's it's currently in, whichever not currently in, but it can be related back to the current, which is why we use voltage sources whenever we do main to find current. Well, for nodal analysis, we use current sources to find the nodal voltage. We can do something similar here in terms of our thought process, where say here is VA, node VA can be equal to our current, not current, voltage across, yeah, across two, not, yeah, current across two can be equal to that node voltage of the voltage across R3 all over R2. A little bit difficult to see that directly, but it's a quick little tip you can do. Not tip, 
trick you can do to go ahead and alleviate some mess of what you're trying to do. Okay, so let's go back through and complete this right here. Let's hold that. Just want to show it to you real quick, and then same thing for I one, I one, same node. All right there, it should be just the source of it because if we were to break it up into its own network, looking at that specific mesh, it would be this equivalent right here. So in a sense, we are applying our properties from name and name. You just have to figure out how exactly it's behaving line by line instead of doing a full blown matrix for it. Into my water real quick. Ben. OK, now that we have that, we can actually all elaborate this back over to the main one we wanted. So we know JG1 is a known source, right? Well, we can claim this since we know. Summation of I1 and I2 should equal. Our voltage. Uh, not voltage, our current of JG1. We can claim this expression right here, which just basically elaborates to this right here. JG1 is equal to B minus R3I3 all over R2 plus BA minus EJ2 of R1. And we want to solve for BA. I'm skipping the intermediate steps as I want to make sure I'm able to cover this in a timely manner. So solving for VA, whatever methods that is, if you do it by hand, go for it. If you have a fancy calculator like the Inspire, you can algebraically solve for it that way. However, whatever means you want to solve for VA, I'm going to show some math. Just to real quick show you the exact expressions of what is going on. This is just some quick algebraic manipulations here. Nothing too fancy. What is going on here? Minus is going to be G2 R1 plus, yeah, R3 I3 of R2. There we go. And then one last little line we do here is going to be B A. be equal to yeah v of r1 r2 is equal to jg1 plus j2 r1 plus 3 i 3 over r2 and then one last manipulation we can go ahead. Actually, not even one last manip manipulation is just all this over the inverse of R1 and R2. So we would go ahead and, you know, solve for it, plug and chug, enter into calculator, do some quick math, however you want to call it. This should get us a value of 19.8 volts. So using our expressions earlier, we claim that I3, not I3, I2, should be equal to VA minus R3. I3 over 2, so we're going to real quick plug that into our calculator from there. If we did that earlier, using that expression, we can say 19.8 minus 12.6 over 6K is going to be equal to 1.2 milliamps, which this is a final step here to figuring out the current across 4, which is just I3 minus I2, which is gas. 3.0 milliamps. OK, so we have that. Right, well, now we need to solve for one more case. We need to solve for one more case. So we're going to go back here. The final case is going to be T equals infinity. OK, T equals infinity. We're going to redraw the circuit one more time or not. Is there a call if you have the time or if you want to see this? Clearly, I will recommend it. If not, you can draw only fractions of it. However, you want it to be. I'm just here doing it for the sake of how I would have done this problem. Here to here. Source is still there. Go down. GG.
background. Okay, so only thing I've done is now claim that this is t equals new infinity, which is basically the same thing as t equals zero. Is just our capacitor has reached charged again. It has reached its exact point where it will now act as a sh as an open. Okay, so that means a couple things. We know v four is going to be equal v four, not just any v four. V four of Infinity is going to be equal to EJ2 of R3 I3. Because all it is really is just a potential difference of your source minus any voltage drops. Again, coming back to KVO and KCL. Using these properties to go ahead and apply them here. By second nature for me, at least for you guys, you may have to think about it sometimes, but that's completely fine. Just please be aware you're going to be constantly using these these principles and we can actually claim a couple of things right now with this. So we know. I2 here is I3, which only seems like direction, but we listed earlier. Guess what, though? The values here are actually equal now because it's, so it's an open. So imagine. This part. Imagine V4 not even there. So I'm going to real quick I'll scratch it out just to show something. Imagine that being not there. It's its own current. It's just they're going to be equal now. The same current is going through R2 and R3 because their sisters in, in series have the same current going through it. It doesn't break apart. So using that, we can actually claim a couple things now. We can say JG1 is equal to our current of I2 and R2, which is, you know, same thing as I3, right? So there's only really two, one more value we want to solve for to get to find our current. We need to figure out what our expression is going to be used for I1. Well, let's go back to our circuit and figure out what exactly can we use. So we have our no voltage here, so we can still say you can we can still use this for our tools of analysis, right? So we can say VA is minusing. If we look at this particular mesh by itself, VA minus EJ2 of R1. That's for our current. Meaning the A is just simply going to equal. R2 plus R3, I2, and this is not my bad. It wasn't miswrote in my notes, but that's just an expression from earlier. What we solved for the A to B is just those values. But now that they're in series instead of in parallel. We're not doing one over one over. It's just adding, adding them together in series. Using our work from the previous portion of the problem to go ahead and speed things up here. So now that we have this, we can actually solve for I1 now. And that's the goal here to find what I2 is going to be to. Which can, you know, domino into finding out a current of I4. Could you do name and or name on this? In theory, yes. You just have to really understand the behavior of your circuit and how it changes. I just like doing it. This method is to show that even if you don't, even if you aren't familiar with name and name, you can still apply your other principles and solve the problem that way. This may take a little bit longer, but I'll still get the you get the job done. So our new expression we're currently working with is going to be. I1 is equal to R2, 3 over R1 over I2 minus EJ2 over R1, which 
means we still need to figure out an expression for r for i2. Well, i2 just basically is the difference of jg1 minus i1. So that's how the current is splitting up right now. At node v8, node v8 is splitting up into its own current for i1, and then i2, which is equal to i3, is the other portion of it. So we can just say the difference between those two components is going to be equal to your, to your current. Now we're going to actually go through and solve the meat of this problem right here. It's going to be I1 equal to the big equation R2, R3 over R1 times JG1 minus I1 minus J2 over R1. Again, all these values are pretty much known, but we need to solve specifically I1. That's what we need solve for. So let's try and figure it out. I'm going to skip a little, a little bit of algebra just to show you guys. Just check yourselves, I guess, if you are doing it by hand or if you have an inspire or not. I just want to see the math. It's better. Okay, there's that. You can plug and chug and simplify a little bit more if you want, but basically the value you should get, hopefully if I didn't make any mistakes, 9.9 .9 milliamps. Well, using this, we can say I2 is equal to the same expression earlier, JG1 minus I1. It's going to be equal to 2.1 milliamps, right? Which means... This is also equal to I3. Well, now that we know I3, we can finally find our voltage across our capacitor, which is just looking at it from a network point of view. We're only looking at this mesh right here. Can you guess what it is? Can you guess what? voltage drop I'm going to use is just going to be R3, I3, what we use for circuit for our voltage at zero. It's a little different though. It's going to be the value of 2.7 volts. And our current, again, the behavior is the same as the thing of how it acts when the capacitor is charged. It's going to be zero. So just to reiterate our values, actually let's take it down here. B4 of zero minus is going to be negative 3.6 volts with zero amps because the switch stated it was closed specifically. That capacitor is charged. At T0, we realize that, hey, that switch caused some current to leak through to our capacitor. A very small amount, but still subtle enough to change its value. And then once when Using our new source, we now realize that the voltage across the capacitor is a new steady state expression. And again, there's no current going through. So just to reiterate what just happened, we went ahead and saw it for our voltage across the capacitor as well as the current, but we're not quite yet done with this problem as there's still a second part. The second part is just solving for the time domain expression. Well, that part is pretty straightforward, actually. It's just now to make sure you know that equation for what you guys have. So pulling this from his notes, from his material, we know that say it's expression is just going to be V4. No, it's actually right to say all around because you guys are used to seeing it all around. Um, it's going to be V4 at zero. Minus the difference of our expo exponents to negative t over tau of of I'm going crazy. 
going crazy right now. Okay. Uh, v for uh, infinity. There's that. Okay. Just to make sure you guys know your tau is the equivalent of that. So you have to short out all your values and work just to get that. So I'll let you believe you guys as an exercise to go ahead and solve for REQ. But the value you should get overall for our EQ is going to be 37.8 times 10 to the negative 6. That's the value you should get for tau. But that's what we want. We want to solve for the 4 of t. So let's go ahead and plug and chug real, real quick. It's going to be pretty straightforward, actually. And that's when we do simplify everything is going to be 2.7 minus 6.3 e to the negative t over that tau value we just got. All of this in volts, and that is our steady state expression in the time domain. Again, really want to emphasize just not freaking out whenever you see a switch. What that just means is your circuit behavior changes. And it may change at zero minus, zero exact, and then zero plus as an in infinity, or it may not change at all as much as you think. So just take it one step at a time. You can do what I do and redraw your circuit a couple of times, and then just slowly figure out a way to analyze it. You guys are familiar with circuits by now. You guys have seen various tools and methods that can help you now. Instead of seeing everything fresh, initially, uh, initially at this at the beginning of the semester. One through solve for three cases, you could say. Case one, was t at zero. Case two, t zero minus to say t zero. And then case three, is the infinity. There you go. And then part B, simple as plug and chug, just making sure you guys understand how to get the R E equivalent value there. But we can actually kind of see it from here, from this one right here. So you would short out, open up anything, short out your current sources, turn your voltage sources into my bad, other way around. Crazy. It is, it is materials, you guys have seen it probably too. I would actually recommend real quick, go through Palm Center 5 actually. Before I forget to say it, Palm Center 5, go through it. It's gonna be beneficial for you as it covers what this exam problem could have been for you guys. It could have been a switch problem and if you didn't do Palm Center 5, well, it may have been a difficult problem. You may have lost out about 30 points here. So please be familiar with it. And the analysis there, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next problem. The next problem is actually a fun one, in my opinion, because this really makes sure that you guys understand what exactly is happening. So second order RL network shown in figure four is driven by the voltage source CJT initial values. So we have initial conditions. That's good for us. OK, and then using the value shown asked to derive the ODE time domain current expression in the form of this giant equation right here. And express the coefficients of A sub I and B sub J symbolically and numerically. And then using those values, this is where it gets a little bit weird again. Calculate the values for your, the undamped natural frequency WN and dampening ratio. Zeta. I can't remember if that is zeta or not. Oh, I apologize if it's not. And then also figure out the response to the system whenever it's overdamped, quickly damped, underdamped, or oscillatory. And then part C is to fully write the hom homogeneous time domain expression with EJT equals zero. And then here's our circuit. Very straightforward questions. There's no tricks behind it. The biggest trick is just understanding what second order is. 
what a second order RO circuit is. Not really RO circuit, it's just second order equations in general. So we're going to do a couple things. There's no need to redraw it. Very simple circuit. There's only two networks, okay? So we're gonna we're gonna mix things up a bit, okay? We're gonna and do main uh, right now. Actually, this is mesh one. This is mesh two. We have those values there. Nothing different there. So it's up to you which method you want to do. So Dr. Russell shows you impedances, right? Where for a inductor, all it is is just uh, SL and capacitors is negative one. Well, negative. Maxing this up right now. Don't tell me I'm getting this mixed up right now. Give me one second to verify. Mm -hmm. I can't believe I'm blanking out on something as simple as this. Yeah, yeah, it's J omega L and then negative J omega C is how you guys are normally used to it. You can use that or a different method that you might have seen as materials if you looked at it already is using the, annihil the annihilator method as in just really using the differential operator D. What that really means is just really in the time domain, we're not going to do impedance, we're not using impedances right now, in the time domain, you're using it with respect to the derivative of it, which just basically means in respect to your currents, because we know we all know this equation, right? Here, actually, I'll, I'll let you guys kind of gloss upon those equations again. Well, the main thing we, we really like between these two is your current and your voltage across these components specifically. Let me change this one. Where voltage is equal to L, di, dt, and then our current of our capacitor is equal to your, your capacitor of your derivative with respect to your voltage. I'm going to pass you guys a curveball and do this in a time domain. See how you guys feel about that. And see if this method work, works for you. If not, then by all means, you can rework this problem. Using impedances, it's be the same exact uh, analyzation where you would go through your values, do these with respect to your impedance. It's just the biggest part is your the omega value since it's not it's, an, it's not an actual like source that we're given that's fluctuating, or what we just know is that is just e g of t. We don't really know its values, but we do know some initial conditions about it and our expression of what's supposed to be. So that's why I'm going to go ahead and use this method. So let's go through without any more hesitation. Just go through real quick and set up our name. So mesh one diagonal of it would be R1 plus your L2 D. OK, nothing fancy here. Very straightforward. Method again. Think back to your calculus. Calculus in your differential linear algebra course. This is a method that they could use to go ahead and solve for the values we want because it's not the meshes, the mesh curves you're trying to find. There's other specific things we want. Having using main though, we can go ahead and more formally solve for it because the main values we want is specifically I2. We want I2. And that's really it. That's our goal. So to finish this, this problem off, to so go ahead and set it up. EGT zero. 
That's our expression, right? So normally, okay, normally you would just do the inverse to find your mesh currents, right? Well, let's try and solve it with respect to I2, their current across inductor 2. Okay, so let's do I2. Well, the main thing is, guess what? It's as simple as just saying it's a difference of mesh 1 and mesh 2. Well, what does that mean, though? It means in terms of our matrix of operations, it'll be the cofactor of 1, 1, and 1, 2 over your determinant times EJ of T. Where do these values come from? If you don't quite know what this means, I would recommend brushing up on some linear algebra and differential methods there. Because that is what we're using here. We're basically trying to use Kramer's rule in a sense to go ahead and find a specific current value we want. Well, let's go ahead and go through and solve for one by one. So, I gotta zoom in. I1, not, not even I1, crazy. We're going to say 1, 1, cofactor of it. So we know this is just first sign change to be 1 plus 1 since we're in position 1 times L2 plus L3, their derivative of it, I plus L4. R4. That's that there. So let's go back through and just real life figure out what I just did. Well, I crossed out row one, column one. We're left with that. And now cofactor is that. That's literally as simple as it is for the cofactor there. Okay, and then to get off our value, since this is I negative one to power of two, it's gonna become positive. So that's our our final value is gonna be L2 plus L3. All that times the derivative of our current with respect to time plus R4. Okay, so now the next step is to figure out what I choose equal to. So, let me same thing again, one plus two. Well, let's figure out which one that is. It is going to be column one, row two, and we're left with that. Did I just get my rows and columns mixed up? I swear. I know algebra. Um. Wow, I really did just blank out on that, didn't I? Oh. I apologize for that. I did not mean. But you, you get to just basically just be negative L of. All right, it would be yeah, negative L to the plus. RM, right? I did miswrite that the first time. I did miswrite that the first time. I'm crazy. Because I realize I'm not using the final matrix. Well, we're going to do some moving around real quick. Because I didn't solve this fully. I'm, I'm crazy. Because we, or I, made a mistake. See, this is why you gotta check your work, okay? So this value right here. The specific one I messed up in was right here. I forgot to sit, include the dependent source. And we know we want to sub out that dependent source or something else. So just to show you what I mean is this matrix. So I'm going to skip a couple of steps again. And all I'm saying is EJ dot T, so zero there, vector two, is technically getting added to a four by four matrix where this is RM because it's specifically mesh one that we have. It would be 
one out of t, minus two t. There you go. That's our actual final. Now final our substitution for our mesh, our dependent source that I missed. In our final expression, the actual final expression would be this right here. This is why I forgot to include. And this is to show it again. There you go. Now we have our actual final final equation. So let's double check our math and see if what we currently had set up was actually still good. OK, so let's zoom back in on it. Scroll down. OK, so we see that mesh one, mesh two is still equal to that. So now looking back at it, we can go ahead and see that for the, the, the cofactor of one two is just crossing out for one column two to get oh by the way around by the way around would be do, do, do. there we go my bad then your well is still something i am still freshening up on here and there do you apologize for that but this is what our cofactor would be here And then we get a negative, negative, cancel out, negative, yeah, L2 of D plus Rm. Okay, we have that there. So now the big one, the determinant, the determinant of our matrix, what is, is just, just put simply, here's a, so say, just to show, just to make sure you guys know. Just to make sure you guys know what it is that any determinant of say a b c d determinant of this is just equal to a d minus b c. That's there. So let's go ahead and solve for it. So just be believe would be yeah. I have a copy of it right next to me. So of our matrix we made. It'd be this times L2, L3, D plus R4, minus, so this is the first cell, that's your AB, or A, A times D, and here is your last two, that, and then L2, D plus R, and there we go, that is your determinant, and we can actually go ahead and solve for it in terms of a second order equation. Why? Because when you go through the algebra, it solves to that. So we're going to go through and show you a little step there, actually. So it would be just bear with me then. You can keep up. Cool. You always want to skim through the video and just see the final result. By all means, you're more than welcome to. I'm just here to show you how Lotus would distribute. Again, what I'm doing here is just expanding upon our equation we just created. Just to show you symbolically, because that's the goal to get this the expression symbolically. RML2D. There we go. That's that equation. I'm at the bottom of this page. I'm going to go ahead and copy this expression over. Copy. Paste. Oh, got that there. Move this up one last little bit. There we go. Okay, so we have this. I'm going to make sure it ain't copied over. R1 times LT plus L3 times the derivative of that. R1, R4, LT, L2, D, L2, L3 times the derivative of that plus L2. Yep, everything copied over. And this is our final expression. So 
now we're just going to go ahead. ahead the goal is to try and get this expression right here in the bin but some constant value some value whether it's the base where it's basically d0 these zero is no there's just nothing there but that's the goal we're trying to find with it so let's go ahead and go through and see about that it would be the final value we give to determine it is going to be l2 l3 d squared plus r1 l2 plus l3 plus r4 l2 minus r m l2 d plus r1 r4 so there is this so this is these are our coefficients what we want to go ahead and solve for so now let's go ahead and go back and see something real quick so let's actually go through and figure out our current mesh 2 well we claimed earlier that mesh 2 i mean current of i2 is equal to mesh 1 minus mesh 2 well symbolically speaking we did technically solve we can solve for it it's just not going to be very pretty because unless you have a inspire the math is going to not be as friendly it is going to be a lot of linear algebra but this is what it is okay so after solving out this for mesh one and mesh two can you claim this i2 is equal to l3 i should probably just i didn't do that it's a, it's a pretty big equation but we're all about to write for you guys i2 of t is equal to line L3, the derivative of it, plus R4 minus Rm over our cofactor. We just, no, no, co no cofactor, our determinant. Okay, so now we go through R1, O2 plus O3. Plus or minus R M O two D plus R one R four E J O T man is hand, you guys is hand cramping up because mine is right now. But to continue where we are going with this. So we just need to insert values now. So we're going to plug and chug now. So insert values. We're going to get some very clean values, in my opinion. I say they're clean just because looking at it, the equation might have looked very ugly. But those are all just values we need to just kind of plug in and solve for. I mean solve for we're given a lot of it. We're not given anything at looking back, we're not actually missing anything. The only thing we're missing is our EJFT value, our source value. That'll come later though. <clears throat> yeah. And please don't forget EJT. As as we're trying to solve for symbolic euro right now, All right? Well, one last thing to do is to still go ahead and simplify this a little bit more, distribute things out and such. So it'd be two d minus three point two five all over. Here, let me actually write that better. Two d. 4d squared plus 1.5e plus 4 ej of t. 
Well, there's a little bit of an issue. If you go back here, we want our expression to go ahead and be only in terms of our expression. Well, there's only one real slight issue that we see right now is really this. This right here, this four, let's go ahead and just normalize it. Let's, let's, let's just normalize in respect to that. So all I'm saying is our new expression we are currently working with is numerator stay the same. We didn't change anything there. This is going to be actually not everything that changed my bad. Math. It exists. It's a rule. I'm going crazy, guys. This is what happens when you just study engineering for your last few years. It makes you go insane sometimes. But it's still cool stuff. So there's our values on the top. That's this is net 50, but 5d. d squared plus 375d plus 1.0. So reason why I'm using d again is just to go ahead and substitute a derivative. That's basically what all it means. This is a notation change. It's a lot easier on my hand. It, it makes things easier for us to go and solve. And this is actually a real notation you can use if you want to go ahead and solve for higher ODEs. And I'm sure certain you must have seen it in your 3319 course, Math 3319 specifically, but if you haven't, then you can probably look in the textbook just to see what I'm what I'm what method this is exactly, but it's just a notation change really. So now we want our expression to be in the form of one side current, one side our source only. Well, only we can do that is if we divide it out. Right. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to divide out both sides by our numerator here, not by numerator, our denominator. So the final equation, what we should get d squared plus 375d plus 1.0 2 of t equals 0.5d minus 25 djt. All right. So again, as I mentioned, all it is. All what our D operator means is just the derivative. So going through it again, this is what we're seeing actually. So we're saying dt squared of our current two is equal, not equal, plus 0.375 derivative with respect to time of our current two. Plus I2 of T is equal to 0.5 derivative with respect to our EJ of T e minus 0.8125 EJ of T. <sighs> so now, finally, this is extra. You don't really have to, like, I guess, do this. They can see it, but just to go ahead and show you. These are coefficient values for your symbolic expression that we just saw it for. So the values we need to go ahead and write out just to, I guess, clarify a couple of things. It would be, what does it say? Is it, what does the question say? Coefficients and symbolic and numerical form. So we just go through. So A2 is tied to that, A1, 3, 2, and 1. So there's a couple of things we can actually say about this. So I'm actually going to copy this over here and just to show well, what exactly the eyes are. So we know A2 equal 375 a1 is going to be equal to 1 b3 there is no higher order of it. it is simply that so b3 is going to be 0 
B2 is going to be equal 0.5. And B1 is finally going to be equal negative 0.8125. That's the main reason why I didn't choose to do impedance, because impedance really only works if you're going to solve for it power dissipation or other values of that. This is simple enough for us, especially since we're given our expected final form for our expression in the time domain specifically, which is why our impedance rules may not have been ideal. Could it have been easier to analyze if our main? Maybe. I'll leave that for your guys' discretion. I just wanted to show the operation done in the time domain using our derivative, our D operator, I should say. That's only part A though. Part B, using the value shown, calculate our undamped nature, WN, and then describe nature of the response, i.e. overdamped, underdamped, critically damped, all that sorts. So, Let's go ahead and get right into it. Okay. All right, is so here stretching a little bit? So I'm going to go and go through. So now this is going ahead and going to be like B. I need to grab the circuit again. Then we're going to grab it. Paste. There you go. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. So this is a lot easier than what it seems, okay? Especially for finding our values, okay? So pulling from chapter Z, okay? In materials seven, there are plenty of examples in there that I want you guys to go through and read for yourself and understanding where I'm gonna go ahead and pull all these values from, okay? There, it's, in my opinion, a little bit weird at first, but it'll still make sense, okay? So let's go ahead and go through them now, okay? So the question specifically asks us for natural frequency and a damping ratio. Well, there's a couple ways to solve for that. But we already have our expression. So let's go ahead and go through and solve for it. Again, please go to chapter Z1 in your material seven. Those values there help us a lot in terms of figuring out our damping ratio and our natural frequency. Again, this specifically may not actually be covered on the exam, but I still want to go and expose it to you guys in case it was because it's specifically promise or five that it's mentioned on possible final exam topics covered since midterm two. Let's go through and real quick, just see what happens, okay? Well, the biggest thing that's, if you go through, look at these materials, these examples, we can see Natural frequency is equal to one. Meaning, this is 1.0 radians per second because that's our frequency, right? So knowing this now, we can actually solve for zeta. Is zeta is going to be Two. This uh, I I still don't know how to write that. Oh, I think I know. So it's like a weird, funny looking three. Equal to point 
375. Because basically, the equation I'm looking at is this. Where your natural frequency is in the front of your coefficient. Plus, same thing here to dampening ratio of WN is equal to your D. And then finally, that's that's really it actually. And then this will just be W, not WN. Let me, pull up, let me see if I can find that equation again real quick. No, that's really it, yeah, because let me pull up the equation again just to show you what I mean. So again, in chapter Z1, he derives that our system can be described as this value right here and Find it right now. And I'm also going here, going through chapter Z1 to find the exact equation without just writing down the answer. Yeah, okay, so basically, this is what I want to touch on right here, okay? Basically, this is our. There's that leaf. By the way, I didn't see it. This is the other way around. I'm going to send it. That's not what I want. I mean, is this this? I'm I, this material. I really do want you guys just to go ahead and read. I'm here at a loss on how to explain this without just sounding like a maniac. But basically, there's a way in chapter Z1 that better explains it than how I can elaborate right now. That's really what it is. And given these values right here, we can actually state our direction of what this is specifically in respect to our value. So since our zeta is greater than one or uh, less than one, it should be under dams. Under damped there and that is really what it is there so now it's gonna get a little bit weirder again okay like i said please go through chapter z1 and material 7 go ahead and better understand what this means okay so now i2 solution the expected solution is gonna be in the form of this it's gonna be kind of weird okay just bear with me about it I lose. It was a spawn decided from the chapter. Okay. Well, let's do finish off this. It's better to go ahead and for you guys to look in the in chapter one Z one. 
Okay, again, I'm not entirely sure how much of this is going to be on the final, but this is still a good example for us to run through. So I'm going to go ahead and write out the rest of it, really, because these types of problems are really kind of they're kind of weird, in my opinion. This is me kind of rambling at this point because explaining this stuff was not really my forte, unfortunately. So I'm kind of at a loss on how to explain this for you guys. And I do apologize about that. But really, a lot of this is simply plugging and chugging, using the right equations and such. His materials derives a lot of it, which is why I never really got the gist of it. But this is what it should be for this one. And then one last one. Point of the these is going to be 0.982266 radians per second. And then last but not least, there's just a few factors that we have to pull from. We have to find our fee and our. That's for Satori. We're currently working in under dam. Ah, yes, so here it is. This is the equation I was trying to find. That's for current. I want. I am, it's not what I want. Okay, there it is. The equation I was trying to find, the base form of it is kind of weird, but deriving it would take a little too long for me to explain correctly. And I would honestly stumble over my words a lot more than what I want to. So this is what it would be. And just to go ahead and make sure you guys are plugging in your values correctly. Would be point one. There is that, and then making sure your calculator is in radians, 0 0.797, degrees, and then last but not least, our M magnitude is going to be equal to just really I to a zero over cosine of our negative phi value, which what that means is just cosine, it doesn't matter if it's negative or not, it'll still, it's an even function, so it doesn't really matter there we just get to two negative points one nine eight seven eight one seven amps our fine ex final expression is going to be i two t equals well what we just saw for him
And that's for part C. Again, a lot of derivation. Is a little bit much for me to explain right now on on video. I would really recommend for you guys to go through and look at chapter Z1. Chapter Z1 goes through a lot of the work I just did and helps elaborate a little bit on it too on how this stuff works. OK, it really is helpful when I say go back and read. His materials the materials do help. My guess is there's a good chance resistive MAME is going to be on there as long, well, as long as one complex network, whether it be MAME or name. You got to understand that KBO, KCO, Ohm's law, Watts law, know those equations, know how they function by heart. He really wants you to make sure he is not the wrestle, really wants to make sure you guys understand the basics. He wants you to understand the basics and he really wants you guys to know it so that way you don't struggle in the future. Trust me when I say this, circuits one is super fundamental in what we do. It will help you a lot if you gain a good understanding on majority of the material that was presented to you guys in class and problem sets and this materials. All of it is super helpful. And one final remark for me is go through problem set five. Problem set five helps elaborate a lot now that you guys have the solutions as well it helps elaborate a lot on what most of what i did comes from maybe not all of it but most of it is helpful specifically all four definitely it's a doozy can be overwhelming very unfamiliar to how you guys are normally used to solving these circuits and it really is essential you guys go ahead and go run through those problems for your own benefit and really take those solutions in because there's a good chance one of these questions is probably going to be on there. That's it for me. I do hope everyone has a good winter break and does well on their finals for fall of 2022, but I am signing off.